So we're going to start up, ladies and gentlemen. It's a truly a privilege to have with us today Roger Peterson uh, on the occasion of the publication of his new book. Um, but uh, I'm happy to tell you that this is just uh, another great book on uh, the the general uh, subject line of the psychology of international conflict and ethnic violence that Roger has uh, written uh, over the last uh, decades. Roger's books have been a staple on the reading list for my class on uh, nationalism for years now. And uh, he is like the, the keystone reading on emotions and ethnic conflict, which is of course lying right at the heart of that topic. And I can't tell you how many midterm exams uh, have been made far more interesting by engaging with your uh, arguments in those two books, uh, soon to be joined by um, I, I'm going to have to start teaching a course in Roger Peterson to fit in all these fabulous uh, books. So um, uh, Roger comes with uh, strong Columbia connections. Roger had uh, a whole year in residence at the Harriman Institute uh, a while back. It was called the Harriman Institute for the Soviet Union. <laughs> Which tells you a little bit how old I am. So. Yeah. Um, and um, a, another very oblique connection uh, to Columbia is that Roger was a student of John Elster, uh, you know, our former colleague, but he was uh, a student of Elster when Elster was at the University of Chicago, uh, not at uh, Columbia, but uh, we get to see a good bit of him in, in any case. And uh, it's always uh, very enriching to hear uh, the ideas that Roger has about ethnic conflict and intervent foreign interventions that uh, don't understand the psychology of that process. Um, although we're without Bob Jervis, one of the things that we're tr uh, trying to keep strong at Columbia is maintaining a good educational and research environment for the psychology of uh, international and uh, ethnic conflict. Um, so, uh, we were all we had that all lined up with Karen Yarhi Milo joining our department, but now she's been derailed a little bit. She's kind of busy uh, as the dean of SIPA, but uh, we have Paula Salamina as a postdoc at the Saltzman, who's teaching about the psychology of, of IR uh, this semester. So. Uh, you know, uh, especially our PhD students in the program know their stuff in the psychology area. So because we teach it uh, not only in Paula's class, but also in the field survey as part of our tradition. So uh, I hope they will speak up and in engage uh, with uh, that part of your remark. So, okay, take it away, Roger. Yeah, well, one, one comment might... My dissertation committee was actually John Mearsheimer was the chair, but it was Jan Mearsheimer, Elster, David Layton, and John Padgett, which was a combination of different kind of people, which was, I hope I merged some of that. A El team of rivals. Yes. <laughs> oh, at my defense, I didn't say anything because there's just those four guys <laughs> just trying to prove they were smarter than the other ones. And that was, oh, I didn't have to say anything. But Elster once introduced me as a leading political scientist on emotions and and uh, conflict. And he said, because I was the only one. This is many years ago. <laughs> but um, I'm not the only one anymore because uh, Trump has made the emotions political world pretty popular these days. So, but let me get on to this book project, Death, Dominance, and State Building. And... Uh, The 
the work for this book probably started in 2010 when I organized a conference at MIT that put the ac academics and practitioners in the same room in a better in an effort to better understand what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I worked on this project on and off probably the last, you know, 14 years or, or whatever. And I have to admit, it took me a very long time to understand some of the basic features of the Iraq War. Uh, it was not just one war. At one time, I thought Iraq was four wars. I thought there was a war in the South, a war in Baghdad, a war in Adwar, and a war in the North. Um, but then, after dealing with people, I saw that the war in the U.S. side was highly decentralized. In many ways, it was a captain's war people working at the company level. On the Iraqi side, the war was equally complex. On one hand, it was fought by a variety of militia, local militias. So there was a lot of this decentralization, many militias at one level, but at the other side, it was a war that involved a struggle of master cleavages, a struggle about dominance and subordination among Shia, Sunnis, and Kurds. So this book has two broad goals. One is to produce a rich description of the Iraq wars and their legacy in Iraq. I have tried to listen to a variety of actors and give some voice to their experience and agency, both on the US side and on the Iraqi side. But as a political scientist, my second goal is to bring an analytical framework to bear in order to provide an explanation for major outcomes. And the two outcomes I, I try to explain throughout this book are variation in violence and state building. So to quickly review the variation in violence, this is a graph that we, many of us saw back in the day of significant acts of violence against U.S. forces, SIGAX graphs. The red line is Baghdad. So what you really notice here is just the incredible increase in violence in about 2006 in Baghdad, and then the incredible drop. And there's one more surge here, which is the last operations in Sadr City. And then you'll see a lot of variation. Some places really didn't have very much violence. Anbar, you'll see some puzzles. The violence in Anbar starts dropping before the surge. This is the surge here. So you get a lot of puzzles about variation in different regions and across the time. Um, this is Iraq body count. These are civilian deaths. This is sort of mirrors the SIGAC graphs, giant rise, giant fall, little spike. This is the ISIS war here. So, you know, the question here is, after all the blood and treasure the United States spent here, how do you get this again? Um, so, how can you get ISIS taking over one third of the Iraqi state after we tried to build a state with a trillion or two trillion, however many dollars we had? And from the, the state building side, why is this the we tried to bring uh, build a strong state? It's not a strong state, it's been persistently weak. Now it's all the talk, talk a lot about the capture of the state by different groups. So I'm going to bring my analytical framework, and some of you that, that read some of my books, the first book I wrote, Resistance and Rebellion, I developed a framework, and it's a version of the framework I came, I came back to. And part of this was that soldiers themselves in Iraq were using some of this framework um, to try to train soldiers. So I decided if it's good enough for them, maybe I'll try to apply it myself. So there's three elements. <laughs> Three basic parts of my framework. One is the idea that people in civil wars or these types of internal conflicts are playing different roles. So there's roles, mechanisms, and strategies. So the first element are different roles. Some people are going to be neutral. They just want to stay out of it. They don't want to work with the insurgents or they don't want to work with the state or counterinsurgent forces. Uh, this is where individuals are placed in these roles. Some are going to be on the insurgent side. 
at minus one, this is unorganized, unarmed resistance. But these are people that are going to give information and maybe supplies and shelter to the insurgents. Minus two, this is armed and local. These are people embedded in their communities that are armed local militias. Minus three are, these are gonna be the tribal forces in Anbar, but other locally based, neighborhood based militias. These, and minus three, these are mobile insurgents. This would be Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Other side, you have the government side. Again, people that are gonna give information um, to the, the state counterinsurgent forces, locally connected, uh, uh, local militias, self-defense militias connected to the government. This is also where I put the local police stations, local armed organized, and these would be the army and the national police at plus three. Now, the big point about this is that people are moving up and down. They don't stay in one position. They are moving up, across different roles. Um, and it is the way insurgent and state or counterinsurgent forces try to shape that movement that is my focus. And one of the to preview, the key argument of the book, it's this level plus two and minus two, which was really crucial in Iraq. And the United States put too much emphasis on the general population. Under FM 324, the general population was seen as the Clausewitzian center of gravity. And I just don't think you can uh, really shape the general population as much as the United States thought you could. A lot of the action, then you can identify some of the mobile and you can kill them different ways. This is really a hard group to get rid of because they are embedded in the community. They have information. They're not easy to identify. So this, the next question then is what is moving people up and down these roles? Why do they move to one role or another? Why do they stay in a certain position? And there is a reason, a cause for these actions. And in social science language, this cause is often called a mechanism, which is the, and this is where I, Jan Elster, he was very important. If you took his classes on methods, he always talked about mechanisms rather than variables. This is the causes. So there's a theory. I think mechanisms fall into four general categories, rational choice, social norms, emotions, and psychological mechanisms. And of course, there are more specific mechanisms within each category. And chapter three of the book outlines a small universe of mechanisms, roughly 15, that are highly relevant to insurgency and violence. And if you look at, you can look at what the United States people are saying. Take a look at this statement. This is Colonel Sassaman. Uh, this, this incorporates an idea about what mechanisms to trigger. And here, it's the mechanism of the emotion of fear. We're going to use violence to deter people. And then we're going to give them a lot of money for projects to appeal to their economic rationality. So this is really a uh, an idea, and I think which was a pretty common one among certain um, military people early on in Iraq. And one of the key arguments of the book is that the U.S., um, following Western culture, relied too much on trying to trigger mechanisms tied to economic rationality, and it did not understand the emotional mechanisms tied to identity and group status in Iraq. And if you read some of my other books, this isn't going to be a surprise, so I found it here also. So this gets to the third element, which is strategies. So there are different sequences of mechanisms capable of working in tandem to drive movement on the spectrum left or right. And both insurgents and counterinsurgents have strategies to try to put these processes into motion. So the fourth chapter of the book details four types of US counterinsurgent strategies that will come into play. So this is uh, four different strategies. Clear hold build. This is going to be associated with Petraeus, Field Manual 324. The idea of 
the triacid clear hole build. It's a sequential strategy. You're going to first move the population. This is a population centric strategy. You're going to move the neutrals and even the unarmed people that are not that committed and not armed yet. You're going to try to move them to the position of support where they're going to give information to the counterinsurgent state side. At the same time, you build up the military of the um, Iraqis here. And with the information coming, moving people to plus one, the information to plus three, you go and you attack the mobile forces on the other side. Notice what this strategy does not want to say. Don't get involved with these local embedded militias any place. This is not the way to build a state, according to FM-324. This is the key here, is moving people here with information and, and they're gonna give. Um, community uh, mobilization is another one, I guess it's tried as an old slide apparently, I got to change that from tribal to community, but the idea here is to flip and mostly, this is looking at the local militias more, to flip those insurgents at this low and make deals to flip them over to the government side. So you're, you're moving over the, the local militia in mass over to here. This is what is gonna be the awakening and the sons of, of Iraq in there. And you can move over some of the, these groups, but these, the minus two, the plus two, and don't worry so much about the population. It's this group that is key. They're going to have the best information. You're going to take an enemy out of this side, and you're going to turn it into your friend. Now, you're going to see this very specifically. This is Ramadi, and this is 2006. And this is a Marine slide. The Marines are in Ramadi. The Marines, these are neighborhoods controlled by a different tribe in Ramadi. And the Marines are coding 12 of them as uncooperative in June 2006, three is neutral and six is cooperative. Now, the community mobilization thing, let's move over the whole neighborhood and the tribe over. And they're going to make some deals. By January 2007, you go from 12 uncooperative to three neutrals, you know, but you're going to go to 12 in the neighborhood's cooperative. So the whole idea is to mobilize the by community here. Um, third strategy is decapitation. Decapitation says, this is just too hard. Too hard to deal with population. Too hard to deal with these militias. Let's just build up, especially our special forces here and just go after. The, the the mobile insurgents are on this side. And this is associated with uh, military likes acronyms. This is F3EA, Find, Fix, Finish, Exploit, Analyze. Do I have that right? Yeah. Uh, this is Joint Special Operations Command. This is JSOC. And under McChrystal, they're going to speed up this site at one time, there's two of this cycle operating in a month. We're going to go to two or three a night. You know, the United States will go to that. Um, and it's network form as opposed to simply, you know, targeting upper leadership. Its goal is to capture senior and mid-level insurgent commanders faster than they are able to regenerate in order to sow fear and confusion and ultimately to cause the network to collapse. Um, but again, it's... Um, a, avoiding a lot of the other kind of messy stuff. Homogenization. This is a, uh, some political scientist and probably Heim Kaufman is most associated with this. The best way to end ethnic violence is physically separate the warring sides and create defensible boundaries between them. And sometimes the, this is really a non-strategy because it's too close to ethnic cleansing. But just let those at plus two and minus two in my roles locally kill each other until they get defensible size. And of course, this is going to happen. This is Baghdad at the time of the invasion. The yellow are the mixed neighborhoods in Baghdad. These are Sunni Shia mixed. Red are Sunnis, 
green, this is Sadr City or Shia. And what's going to happen? Take a look at this map. Look at how much of it is yellow. No yellow left by 2007. This is going to be almost completely unmixed. Sunnis are going to retreat over here. Shia are going to become the demographically dominant group, but the lines are drawn. And um, uh, so that's sort of homogenization. So there's different aspects of these strategies and different um, combinations of them. And so then I moved to apply my framework to nine case studies in the second section of the book. Uh, and several of them are going to, well, I got one more slide here. So just to overview this, I think structural variables don't explain very much. We had from about 2000 to 2010, I think there were 600 large end studies of civil war that look at these variables. I, I don't think that they were very good. Well, they were pretty good, but there's only so much to explain. My basic independent variable is the combination of strategies, what the US uses as a strategy versus the insurgents. And the idea is these, this combination is gonna breed certain sets of mechanisms which then change the movement of spectrum on the rolls, which then help explain variation in violence and state building. And so the second, the first part of the book explains this method. Second section is gonna apply the method to 2003 to 2011 in nine case studies. The third section then treats the outcomes here as the independent variable for the outcomes from 2011 to 2021. And that's the third section, fourth section is speculation about the future. So what I'm gonna do in the second section is you're gonna see a lot of case studies. This is a very simple one from Sadr City. That's the Shia area that's controlled by Muqtadr al-Sadr. At one time this was called Saddam City. Before that was Revolution City, but when I'm studying it, it's Sadr City. And you look at the US strategy and you look at the strategy of the Sadrists, who are the Jaysh al Mahdi militia and the, their social and political organization, the Office of the Martyr Sadr. And I build this up from interviews. Largely, I did an interview with an S2, that's an intelligence officer who was in Sadr City during this time, also different military officers. And then I'm also going to talk to other Iraqis that were living in the neighborhood. But the U.S. side, again, was just focusing on winning hearts and minds, trying to move the general population over here. And the police forces and the invasion had completely collapsed, rebuilding the police forces at plus two. The Sadrists, on the other hand, had a whole alternative social system being built for housing and distribution of cooking oil and food. So they're moving people over to minus one through their political and social organizations. They are building up the Jaysh al Mahdi militia at both the local embedded and at the mobile uh, levels. On So they're filling in this side of the spectrum. They are infiltrating the local police forces and doing a better job of controlling them in the United States. And they have a policy of hitting the U.S. forces with IEDs and harassing them, although it's very much calibrated. What had happened in 2004, the Jaysh al Mahdi rose up and they got badly beaten by the United States. They got mauled. And so they are going to rebuild during this time. And of course, this is a key case because these forces are going to ethnically cleanse Baghdad and they're going to change the whole shape of Iraq. So how do they manage to do this? And why isn't the United States being able to do anything? They do not want to take on the United States. They do not, do not kill high-level officers in the United States on purpose because they don't want them to come too hard on them. They are in a period of, of building during this time. Um, another reason why the United States and why are the Sadrists, I'm going to, I mean, the idea, the Sadrists are the most important and powerful force today. In 2024. Um, how is that possible? Why did we allow them to build this? But one of the advantages of the Sadrists is they have a 2 million 
uh, uh, demographic hub, which is almost impenetrable. This is, you can read this, this is another interview from a soldier operating in Sodder City, special forces operator, who is going to uh, be on raids into Sodder City, trying to, to do some sort of decapitation. Um, this is one thing you do when you get a lot of interviews together, you get some, some very good descriptive material. Not that easy to get into Sodder City. It's very, um, very uh, uh, controlled by the Sodders and still is to a large extent today. This is not the only case. This is a Bayad neighborhood in Baghdad. Um, this is built, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, this case is built by one of my PhD students who was a captain. He was leading a company in Bayad. I'm using his diary. He wrote a dissertation on his experience in Bayad. I'm using his field work. And what is his strategy? Again, trying to move people into arts and minds through public process and then going after the minus three with raids. What was the Jaysh al Mahdi, the Sadrist, the OMS doing? They were, um, they ethnically cleansed the Sunnis. They had a housing function. They were doling out houses to Shia that were displaced in other areas in Bayah. Uh, they were, Mixing the Jaysh al Mahdi was mixing their militias with the local militias. They were um, taking over the local police stations, and again, they were keeping the U.S. forces with explosively poem. Uh, this is EPFs. These are IEDs from Iran. Um, very effective sniper attacks on U.S. forces. My student guys lost people, shot in the head, right next to him. Um, he'll say that they lost to the Sovereigns, U.S. He'll just make that statement that they lost. This is chapter 10 in the book. I believe it's the single best um, analytical chapter on the surge that exists, and largely because of my, my student was actually flagged. So uh, these case studies have important insights. There's two chapters on Sodder City, one later. And again, the chapters have a point to them. And the point is, how are the Sodorists after getting whipped in 2004, and they get whipped again in 2008, the U.S. goes in the Sodor city, they destroy the Jaysh al Mahdi, uh, Sodor is going to disband them. But a few years later, the Sodorists are again having militias and again controlling much of the government functions in, in a lot of Iraq and the, the, what these case studies and this method does is show you that the Sodorists can effect mechanisms to move people at every level of the spectrum. They can develop militias. They can develop social organizations here. They can take over the state functions here. And they're also going to take over government ministries, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. The Sunnis, the U.S. forces... They cannot operate. They only operate on certain parts of, of this spectrum, but the, the Sodorists can operate all over it, which is why they are, can maintain it. This explains a lot of their resilience. So Section 3 covers the aftermath and legacy of 2003 on the period of 2011 to the near presence, or to the near present. So there's much to say about how the nature and transformation of Iraq from 2011 to the present uh, and then how the previous events helped shape it. I'm going to tell a short general story that links the two periods. In terms of state building, the common political unit in Iraq arising out of the 2003-11 era was a political militia religious amalgam. For instance, the Badr organization, the Sadrist organizations, Kataib, Hezbollah, Asab, El Haq, um, we tend in, in the West to say, well, we're going to separate the military, the violent, and the political. This is all one thing in Iraq. Uh, and these groups are going to capture sections of the state during the 2003-11 period, and they are not going to let, let it go. 
Uh, these units have persisted and they found even stronger hybrid presence in the state in the form of the popular mobilization forces. You might have noticed in the news, Kataib Hezbollah, they were responsible for killing three U.S. servicemen, uh, service people um, in, uh, in Jordan. Uh, they are getting directions from Iran in part, and they're also getting paid. They're on the, the Iraq state payroll. So they, these are the units that exist there. They're, the difference between state and non-state is not the Weberian kind of idea that, that we've taught or comes out of our tradition. So many groups got in to this game, forming similar amalgam organizations. Uh, chapter 17 is about the formation of the, the Hash al-Shabi or the uh, popular mobilization forces. Chapter 18 shows that even the Iraqi Christians, after the ISIS invasion, form militias and strategically position though their political militias to gain a modicum of state power and resources. This is just the game to get a mo political militia and and uh, um, and get resources through that way. The, so the persistence and dominance of this fragmented system has had three profound effects, and two of them are actually positive. Um, one, the, the system right now is largely stable. Uh, above all, this is because Shia organizations became dominant in the system. By 2018 or so, the Kurds and Sunnis have basically come to accept their role as renters in a Shia-dominated state. Uh, but the era of mass sectarian violence is over. They're not going to be challenged. This is one of my points. You would get this violence when there's not clarity in a status hierarchy system. Once there's clarity, people fall on the line and start making deals a different way. That level has, has happened. Um, so, and given this fragmentation and the fact that so many organizations retain a capacity for violence and defense, the, this weak system also provides a measure of stability. In a fragmented system with these types of, of violent religious actors, no one wants a strong state because the strong state could be captured by another group and they could come after them. Nobody wants another Saddam Hussein in this place. They are satisfied of having this weak state because they also have the Muhasasa system, which everybody gets part of the sports. All of these groups, let's not fight each other. Let's not any of us become very powerful and let's all divide up the, the money. And 93% of the government revenues is coming in through oil. Let's divide it up and not, not and it, it works for everybody, except for the people of Iraq. Uh, so while there's a measure of stability, this system is highly inefficient. It lacks transparency, among other problems. The current major threat in Iraq is not sectarian fighting, but just from very poor governance. Um, so when we went into Iraq, there were a lot of, uh, well, neocons mostly, were gonna tell us, well, this second, this is the second, second section. So one, I'm gonna have a, uh, chapter on the Sunni Shia cleavage. Ghazalia, this is a chapter on Sunni mobilization, the Ghazalia neighborhood and Baghdad. Seven is the Sadr city. Eight is the Mansour neighborhood, which is one of the wealthier neighborhoods in Iraq or in Baghdad. This is the failure to establish local security. I'm going to talk about the capture of the Ministry of Interior by the Badr organization. Um, now, uh, this is the chapter I mentioned by our Captain Wright, who's now a colonel, goes to Baghdad, which is written mostly with on his information's dissertation. Chapter 11 is Anbar. This is co-written with John Lindsay, who you may know is one of the uh, leading specialists on cybersecurity. But John had been in the Navy. He was called up into um, Naval Reserves, ended up in Anbar in 2008 as a community affairs officer. So John and um, wrote um, 
uh, and I wrote the Anbar chapter 12, is Battle of Bot Bot uh, Sodder City 2008, the surge of reconsideration. I take on Biddle a little bit here. And 14, the Kurds, Kurds are out there, but the Kurds have everything to build a strong state and they don't. And so we can talk about some of these cases in the Q&A. This is what a lot of people believe. And even people like Conan and Makia were saying, I, Iraq is going to be like Eastern Europe, a totalitarian after communism, a totalitarian system that is going to not leave any organizations. It's a blank slate. And you can read what people are writing. So there's non-state actors and Iraq polity. The state security forces are all going to be controlled here. The emigres are going to come in, especially the emigres, and lead this democratization, democratic competition. It's going to be a very simple kind of thing is what was sold to the, the, the spice of the world. I won't get into that. That's not my book. But this is the reality of it. The reality of the state is that non-state actors, especially Shia non-state actors, the Badr organizations, Asai of El-Haq, Qatay of Hezbollah, Sadr, and, and, and its militias, they are going to get into the state control security forces. They're going to be political, religious, and militia. They're going to also compete as political parties. These political parties are going to take over state agencies and ministries, which are divided. And Iran is going to be directing some of these. Now, that's a big question, how much they direct them and how much independence they have. But this is actually the messy state. It did not occur. And this is what we have. Or all of these groups, which are, are both non-state and state, violent, religious, political. Um, this, this is me. You can tell my white hair here. This is a couple of years ago. I am talking. What's happened after the Sunnis and Kurds become renters in this state it's the Sadrists on one side and all the other Shia groups against the Sadrists. That's the system that exists now. And all the other groups are coordination framework are the other groups against Sadr. This is, happens after a, a lot of civil wars, right? Irish Civil War, well, you, you win your independence, but then the Irish are going to go different sides against each other. The Shia have done that. They're, in my estimation, they're not going to go to another war, although they have fought each other. But... I'm talking to members. I was invited to talk to the coordination framework. These are groups um, that are opposing Sadr politically, but they're almost all Shia. They may have asked one or Sunni or Kurdish person to come just to say they're not completely Shia. But you'll notice this guy. This guy is Muhammad Shia al Sudani. He's the prime minister of Iraq right now. This meeting was a, a few months before he became prime minister. Uh, this tells you something about the system, though. When I talked here, he was just another guy. There was nothing special about al-Sudani. And that's the guy they want as prime minister. All of these groups do not want to put a really powerful person that controls a powerful group into the position. They are happy with this weak state. Um, and... And because they're all they're all managing to, to do their patronage networks, and nobody can really threaten violently the other side. Uh, so um, this is sort of where we are. So the, the fourth section of the book, this is the third section. Kawija, this is a Sunni area. The U.S. pacifies it. There's very little violence. It is going to become the center in 2012 for Sunni resistance against the Iraqi state under Maliki. And they are going to cooperate. The Sunnis here are going to cooperate with ISIS when they come down. So the United States, although in Hawija, they were very good actually at violence dropping to almost nothing. They do nothing. The United States policies do nothing to prevent the Sunnis two years later in this area becoming ISIS collaborators. Uh, which shows just the just didn't really fill the state in this in this case. This is the third Iraq war. This is the ISIS war. Uh, the United States is very good in this ISIS war. Actually, I think that they they have a system of 
getting information and using new technology. Mm -hmm. So I'm, the United States was not stupid lots of times, especially when they could use uh, advantages and weapons. Hybrid actors, this is a popular mobilization forces. Uh, this is a strategy in the Christian militias, which, you know, Christians wanted to stay out of militias, but it's the only game in town here. This is written with Matt Kansian, who's at the Naval War College now. He was an ex-Marine working in Nineveh. Um, Kurdistan again. And then I'm talking about the decline. of. I talked about the resentment, emotion being so important. But now that the Shia are basically in control, there's not, that resentment is going to decline. The emotional power for sectarian war is largely gone. And because this is such a young state, we are getting more and more youth that just are disconnected from the sectarian fighting from before they're living in a different world. This is section four then, the future. I just go through finding some lessons, talk about how a lot of what we, these lessons are not gonna be learned because of the US political system largely. And then I talk about the future. In the future, one of the things I do is go back to the strategies. Which of these strategies are we gonna use in the future? Clear hole build. This is expensive and manpower and money. The US is not gonna do this. There's no appetite for this classic counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency is sort of a dirty word right now with a pure competition. Uh, and the bigger problem for Western state building projects illustrated by this case is that for much of the world states are no longer states in the Weberian sense states increasingly lack control of le legitimate means of violence and the means to project centralized power and western interveners may not wish to launch state building strategies in an environment that they cannot predict shape or understand uh, decapitation this is, we're going to do this we're going to use drones and other missiles to kill people. And there's no doubt. And it's, I think it's, this is gonna be the most common strategy of the US military intervention moving forward. And I think the US try to develop relationships with special forces communities and allied states around the world. And uh, we are, there's a uh, temptation to engage in lawn mowing. Uh, on a global scale. Um, I think this preference for decapitation and the U.S. addiction to bombing has many problems. I think there's severe limits on what bombing alone can do, not to mention the moral and legal issues of it. Community mobilization. Uh, this is highly effective because, again, it takes an enemy away and makes it an ally. These people have the best information about going after the other people on this side. Uh, and you can see the awakening in the Sons of Iraq. They were highly effective in the in, um, U.S. being able to drop violence in a lot of these places. But it's a short-run solution. Um, community, the deals made between the counterinsurgent and the community leaders are not likely to reduce the latter's local base, their agency, or autonomy. These groups can work both sides, changing back and forth, always looking for a better deal. So the U.S. is likely to continue practicing forms of community mobilization. We're going to do proxy war, but the nature of this game, I think, will be opportunistic and ad hoc. Uh, homogenization. If master cleavages and concerns about group hierarchy are salient in a, in a violent conflict, conflict may not end until there's clarity in that hierarchy. And in fact, that's the big story I'm telling you about Iraq. Um, with separation, all the territories have a local dominant majority. And I think, and you eliminate security dilemmas and the other ideas that I'm coughing and others have said about this. And given the overall reticence to engage in large-scale military invent, intervention after Iraq and Afghanistan, I think the United States is going to have a tendency to allow more and more future conflicts to burn on. I think Iran and Afghanistan have sapped Americans' confidence in intervention. It's just best to look away. Um, in the absence of the U.S. will to militarily intervene, accepting homogenization may become an unstated policy 
for many of the world's most violent conflicts. And this again, not too long ago, we saw the idea about right to protect R2P. I don't, I don't see that going very well here. Um, U.S. U.S. comparative advantages bases everywhere. And I think what we're going to do is we're not going to build armies. We didn't do a very good job of that in Iraq, but we can build special forces, communities, and intelligence and use these to help us with decapitation and community homogenization. And I think that's where we're, we're going. Okay, so let me um, conclude with three final comments. Uh, one is the relative power of different mechanisms. And mechanisms connected to group identity and group hierarchy are more persistent and usually more powerful than economic incentives. And that's something which is in the other books, if you've read them in Jack's class, this is just what I find. I, I think this is human nature. I don't think this is in Iraq. Um, I mean, this is, we're doling out money like this in Iraq. Or with certain money, commanders, emergency, whatever. This has very short-term effects. What has longer-term effects? These are Arab officers from the Iraqi sitting in the governor of Kirkuk's office, a Kurd. You can tell it's Jalal Talabani, so this is a PUK office. They're all taking pictures of themselves in the Kurdish office, right? Because the Kurds had an independence referendum, and the Arabs, they've been struggling over the, the disputed territories. The Kurds had taken uh, disputed. They're going to go in there. They're going to sit in the governor's chair. This is really what a lot of conflict is about. And it wasn't just in Iraq. It was in Yugoslavia. You know, I'm married to a Serb. Serbs were just not going to accept becoming second-class citizens to Muslims. Awesome. Uh, and this is in the United States. Gee, look at our own country. We talk about white supremacy all the time. This is about status hierarchy, status dominance, unjust subordination. And the economic incentives, you know, Biden's whole plan is to, I'm going to build public works projects in some of the Trump areas and show that economically I'm good for them. Well, 97% of the people who voted for Trump before are going to vote for him again because they see this world we're in is a status world and that their world is being destroyed by the Democrats. Uh, I'm also the vice president of an agricultural corporation in Nebraska. So I get back there a lot. And um, I, they're all vote for Trump. And they don't care about whether Biden had built some project and neither do these Shia groups. They were at this minus one level all the time. It's very hard to move them over to plus one. Um, given this, second point, I think that the Shia were going to become dominant and Iran was going to have large influence in, in Iraq. I think that's inevitable. I think it was inevitable. I don't think military intervention is a tool that could have done anything about that. Um, I was talking to Professor Betts before this. I was reading because somebody told me I should reread the irony of Vietnam, the system worked. But at the end of it, you know, the system was there to um, prevent communism, but it wasn't going to change the long term effect. And I think the United States went in. There are things that the United States did that did make an effect. Um, especially on the levels of, of violence, and especially temporarily. And I think they did some things which um, it's unbelievable they didn't have the intelligence to think that there's going to be a Shia militia coming out of Sadr City. I mean, two million people there organized already with that mentality. Um, the Ghazalia case, I, I did it based on insurgent interview with people from numbered neighborhoods of Army veterans. Veterans were in a, and you know, they were the source of violence there. Some of this United States just didn't know what they were getting into at all. Um, but they learned, and a lot of it, and the combination sometimes, and the synergy that, that Professor Bill was written about did have a perspective on, on some of this. But the state building part, 
and about the Shia becoming down. I just don't think, I think that was, once we're going to have democracy, this group at 60% and which had the mentality and also the organizations coming in, the Bada organization had been, it's a highly professional organization it's in Iran for 20 years before the invasion. They're going to come in and have an agenda. The Sadrists are there in Sadr City. They have an, an agenda. And these agendas were sophisticated and very smart, and we weren't going to stop that. Uh, the U.S. also just cozied up to, to some of the groups too much. Military officers, and this is, you know, you talk about the military versus State Department. U.S. military officers like working with Bahr, this Iranian-controlled group, because they were professional soldiers, and they had an affinity with them. They like working with the Peshmerga. U.S. was way too close to the Peshmerga in Kurdistan. Uh, so they could have done things a lot better, but some of the things are just not possible for military intervention to change. And the last point I want to talk about, because a lot of graduate students in here, um, and I've been in this business a long time, and I'm, I'm, I'm retiring soon. And the one thing I did smart during my career was develop the capacity to learn from my graduate students. And this book is a lot of collaboration for graduate students. So, uh, and this is my student, Marcin al Shamari. She's an Iraqi. She came, she had a dissertation on Shia politics. Oh, everything I know really about Shia is coming from having Marcin there. She teaches at Boston College now. And she got me access to you know, this is uh, Ayatollah uh, Amara al Hakim. He is the he was head of the uh, ISKI, which was secret, the Bader connected political group. Now he's head of Hakim, but I wouldn't have any of these contacts had I not uh, worked with Marcin. Um, this is my the dude in Baya. He was on the cover of Newsweek magazine as the face of the Petraeus generation. He applied to graduate school at MIT. I noticed in the Newsweek article, as men all call him Captain America, I said, yeah, we got to get Captain America here to straighten out some of our grad students in here. You know, we need some help here. So he's, he's chapter 10, Captain America Delta Fire. Um, and John Lindsay, um, he and I wrote this for the Center for Irregular Warfare and Armed Groups in 2012. And a lot of the ideas on that spectrum of the strategies come from John. And so John, uh, he and I, he co-writing chapter 11 on ANVAR. Um, Matt Cancy, and again, ex-Marine was in Nineveh. I also relied a lot on military personnel to get in with um, interviews with insurgents. Because when we flipped in the community mobilization strategy, we flipped the local militia guys over to our side. They became good friends with some of the U.S. military guys. And they got me in touch with these former insurgents, which were most, most of my work is done in Amman, Jordan, because a lot of these people could not live in Iraq. They, they'd been killed. So former insurgents, I spent the chapter on Ghazalia, I spent three days um, sitting around um, with the former insurgent leader in Amman, Jordan, had to be reported to the security forces in Jordan. But the main thing we're talk, talking with some questions before about all the skills and you got to have causal inference and natural experiments. Probably one of the, the things that I, I did was learn how to smoke hookah. <laughs> um, so I could sit around and the insertion guy was a you know hookah fan. This is sitting around in his apartment in Jordan smoking hookah talking about what happened and how he tried to kill Americans in 2003 and four. And uh, any rate, and then finally, I, State Department people, this is a, looks like a criminal lineup. <laughs> yeah. But uh, State Department people too, not just military. This is Iyad Alawi, he was the first prime minister mm -hmm. of Iraq. This is Palal Nakib. He was the Minister of Interior who created the Wolf Brigades, which were um, a, sort of a controversial part of the Minister of Interior. And then the Ministry of Interior was taken over by the Bader organization after the 2005 elections. And 
the chapter on local security and state capture, several interviews with Nakib. This is Rod Alhamdani. He was one of Saddam's top three generals. I don't know who this bad little guy is, probably running everything. But, <laughs> you know, what, what, this is another question. Why, why is Saddam's general and the prime minister and these people all sitting, again, in a compound next to the American embassy in, in Amman? That's a longer story, which I'll not get into, but it's, a, it's an interesting place to work. Amman and Herbal are sort of like Rick's Cafe American and uh, <laughs> Casablanca. So I'm going to stop there and yeah. get back to you know, let me put this slide up in case we're asking with that and I'll take questions. Yeah. You can feel flexible yet? Yeah. So that was great. We often have talks here about field research methodology, but you've added a whole new dimension that's usually <laughs> missing. So uh, I'm going to make uh, some comments that are like halfway between discussant remarks and actually questions, which you can do like whatever you want to uh, with them, uh, hitting on a few of the different big conceptual issues that uh, you raised in your talk and book. So uh, I was especially interested in your depiction of state society relations, uh, where it's this amalgam of tribal, political, religious, military, uh, and where there's often uh, very little, if any, distinction between what's state and what's non-state, and where the, uh, the, the, the players are uh, fragmented or undifferentiated, as modernization theory would put it. This is something that would be completely normal in a pre-modern society. And yet, you know, here we are in the 21st century, and these guys are like fighting and sometimes winning wars and, you know, running an oil state with this sort of pre-modern uh, organization scheme. So I'm wondering, you know, how does this fit into the say, Peter Katzenstein uh, our argument about there being multiple forms of modernity. You can have the liberal democratic version of modernity. You could have the Weberian technocracy, uh, like Chinese version of modernity. And is this a mod, uh, is this a version of modernity? Or is this basically a failure of modernity that is essentially a dead end. It's a problem for R2P because this kind of system is you know, not gonna play by the rules of R2P. So it doesn't fit into modernity, but it, or is it a form, just a different form of modernity that's gonna be around for a long time, semi-successful? Uh, second question related to that is in this kind of uh, uh, state society setup, how do you calculate who has power? So when you were talking about, uh, oh, well, insofar as Iraq is a democracy, we know that, you know, in a democracy, people vote. And if your group has 60% of the votes, then you're going to like win the election. But your whole talk was about the fact that voting is perhaps only a small part of who has power and who comes out on top. Uh, power is lying in the streets. And uh, the way you get what you want is by uh, winning the fight. So tell us how we do a calculus of power when power is not the ballot box and demography, but is the the outcome of uh, this uh, semi-organized fighting. Uh, third, uh, emotions, your, your calling card from your career. Um, so you um, juxtapose not only here, but also 
in your Western intervention in the Balkans uh, book, the idea that the West goes and does its military interventions with a theory based on economic rationality, whereas the game that's really being played by the locals involves identity politics and status. Um, but I have a couple of questions to ask about how uh, different emotions are from uh, rationality. So in your first book, uh, you talk about instrumental emotions, which um, you define as being goal-oriented and to some extent uh, taking into account the costs of action. Um, and you use the you know, list of emotions from that first book here in this analysis, the ones that you stress in, in uh, the new book are fear, anger, and resentment. All of those are goal-oriented or instrumental uh, motives. Uh, perhaps the calculus is not done exactly in a rational way, uh, but they are goal-oriented, uh, such as uh, resentment is a motive that motivates you to improve your position in the, the status uh, hierarchy, as, as you kind of described in your empirical analysis. Um, but then my next uh, point following on from this is, uh, is, is the goal of status um, heavily overlapping with the goals of rational strategic action, or is it something that's an, an entirely non-rational uh, goal? So, you know, when Weber in his essay on class status and, and party talks about status systems, he's talking about systems like uh, the aristocracy of the Middle Ages or the Hindu status system, where status reinforces the monopoly of violence of the elite and the economic privileges of the elites. It defines property rights. It says who uh, gets what kind of job in society, who has the right to bear arms, uh, and uh, who has an honor obligation uh, to, to fight uh, and to sit in the governor's chair. All of these things involve identity and status, but they all also involve power and privilege and uh, you know, economic uh, benefits. Um, so um, in uh, your first book, one of my favorite parts of it is where you explain that uh, the Balkan status hierarchy was originally set up as a residue of uh, economic development as outlined in uh, the great book on nationalism by Ernest Gellner, uh, which uh, uh, defines both status and economic uh, power in terms of the division of labor that resulted from those, uh, uh, those uh, processes of modernization. And so this sounds uh, uh, like different from uh, calculative rationality in some ways, but it, it sounds to me not uh, certainly economically irrational to, if you're thinking about status as the, the way that uh, you get these residues of power in society. Um, so as contrasted, for example, 
uh, to the other, uh, for some people, more familiar way of thinking about status, the Thorstein Veblen idea that uh, that in modern society, people are obsessed with conspicuous consumption, where it's all about a grand display that uh, is seemingly pointless, uh, but drives rivalry and competition in, in modern society. And uh, so um, tell, us, tell us more about these, how these emotions are working and uh, whether status is like part of economically rational competition and militarily rational competition, uh, just the way that competition is done in this kind of society, or whether it's something that's uh, cultural, irrational, and Im impenetrable by this kind of Western version of rationality. All right. Let me take the first about modernity. And I'm not, not up to speed on modern, modernity per se, but the system in Iraq, I think, it, like I said, it's, it's functional. In fact, my wife and I were taking Ubers around Baghdad a year ago, wouldn't now after the Gaza thing, it's, it's changed already. But um, the, the problem is that it's a system which still has security and still the idea of violence is possible is all underneath it, which means that the militia parts of these political parties are not going to give up. And the and, um, so if you took away that and had a very stable state, it would be possible um, to maybe demobilize the popular mobilization forces and build just the state government and get out of these hybrid groups. Uh, and you could maybe move towards that more standard idea about a state. But the security thing is functioning with democracy. Iraq is a democracy in my view. Um, they have elections. Those elections do matter. Now, the, the, the problem is, though, like in a parliamentary system in England, you win, you become prime minister, you take over all the offices, and you exclude a group. There's a loser group. The problem in Iraq is nobody wants to have loser groups. You can get like 1% and you still are gonna get some of the spoils because nobody wants that group which has weapons to be able to be dissatisfied and, and do this. So this became, this is a, a, a sort of a democratic system, but with the security and, and given the groups that came during the 2003-11 period, you're not gonna get rid of them very easily. And then there's also just what we study in comparative politics about patronage. They're all, you know, patrons flowing to everybody. But why doesn't one group, hey, we won the elections, we're going to take all the patronage to our side. And that's because it did go through this very violent period. And, and we like the fact that everybody is, is sort of in on this game. So this system, and by the way, it's it's pretty much close to consultation. It's, this is a pretty much a consultational system in a way where all groups get something there's sort of veto powers on all groups. It's a consociational system with a legacy of violence in the recent past, which keeps the, the, the militia part of this going. And of course, the PMF is um, you get both state funded militias and patronage jobs. And these groups are also doing their own taxation systems different places. So it's it's highly fragmented, but it's it's a sort of an odd type of consociational democracy with a security, um, uh, underlying security uh, issue. And it, it doesn't work that badly. Uh, you know, we, we sit around wallowing about how we destroyed Iraq. Iraqis are not doing that. They're moving on. And, and you know, I was invited to another thing. They didn't really want to talk about the past. They want to talk about the future. 
but it'd be very it'll be very hard to get rid of this system. Now, where this fits on our modernity kind of models, I'm not sure, but it, it, it's a mixture of modernity, and it's not really tribal. You know, it's it's going to be different than Afghanistan would be in that way. Um, uh, so, I mean, there are some tribal elements, but it it people got recruited into this, and some of these groups now have been there for so long that they have their own organizational identities and recruitment that are going to keep going, like Tai Hezbollah and AH and some of the other groups. Uh, uh, and Kurdistan, which didn't have, I mean, well, they still have the security element, but the security organs are are um, uh, dividing up the state in a lot of ways. So it's this odd mix of a state still not confident about its security and these organizations that developed during an insecure and violent period and the persistence of them and where it goes in the long term, I'm not sure. But a lot of the resentment and of the groups is, is sort of faded. After ISIS, the Sunnis, that was a disaster for Sunnis. They're, they're just like, you know, we're done. We're never going to have the role that we did. And our, it's not unjust for us to have a position underneath the Shia of 60%. It took 20 years and, and a war for that to happen, but that happened. The Kurds, the independence referendum, after that, that was a disaster. And again, the PUK and KDP split and the Arabs came in and took the, the central state, basically. Being an Arab force came in and took, and this is like, well, we're not going to talk about independence seriously again for the 20 years. This is sort of what's going on there. So I'm not sure, but this is, I think, the scope conditions, which you could probably take to other cases, of uh, some democratic associational forms mixed with this legacy and still abiding fears of the security system, and it creates a state which is dysfunctional and distributing jobs and, and goods, but it solved some of the other problems. Now on, on emotions, because I anticipated. Uh, I anticipated the emotions question, so I have a slide here that will help. I think you have to go side by side, or side to side, not side to side. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. If you have a rational choice idea, it's you have certain preferences that are ordered and transitive. You take the desires of the preferences. You find an optimal amount of information about those desires and preferences. You form beliefs about the best way to get your desires and preferences, and you make an action. And this thing should just be cycling around in a rational choice way. Now, emotions, the way I treat them is you have this sort of cycle, but then of the cognitions you have and the beliefs, you have an emotion, and that emotion will have, and this is where emotion theory is coming, different emotions have different effects on shaping your preference function, which is you're really getting off the boat with rational choice if, if you're not having a stable preference function, shaping your information collection, and shaping your beliefs. Now, I don't make a distinction between rational and emotional and, and irrationality and emotion. Sometimes emotions are highly rational. I mean, I care about my income, my my safety, and um, my status, and I'm being chased by a bear. Well, fear is going to make me raise safety above anything else, right? It's going to make me obsession, obsessive with that, and it's going to focus my mind on the best information about getting away from the bear, and should I fight or, or fight or flight, if I'm going to get a belief about that. So 
emotion could be helping you in every way on this, but emotion can also be interfering with the outcome. Um, it can make you obsessive about something. And I think uh, my idea about where emotions come from is they have to be based in actual human experience. They're not created very powerfully by leaders. Um, if you are in a system where you're under a checkpoint all the time by another ethnic group, you are going to feel the status of them having their power over you. The resentment is going to become a, an emotion. And you're going to think about, God damn it, why are those people checking my bags and not letting me move in from point A and point B? And then you're going to look for information. And one of the things about emotions is what we feel, we will look for information to confirm. We want to confirm our emotions. Terrorists, they want to make safety so obsessive that you are going to bend your information in certain ways that they want you to see or want you to feel. So, you know, after 9-11, it was still a lot safer to get on an airplane than driving your car, right? But you didn't look at the numbers here because the fear for your safety made you shape all you saw were, not, you know, planes flying in the buildings. And that's the male man. And then you form beliefs which weren't quite optimal. So emotions can have, have um, different types of effects which can orient you towards accomplishing a goal. And, and Probably most of the time they're doing that. But if you're talking about violent conflicts, um, and this is what Zarqawi understood when he bombed the mosque in Samara, that that was very clearly, anger is the most intense when the perpetrator of an act against your group is, that's that group, my group, he did it in order to insult my group. Zarqawi bombing, holy symbol of Shias, knows there's going to be anger. He wants to incite civil war. Sistani says, don't let your anger get a hold of you. Take a look. We, you know, here's the information. Sistani is given information, and they're getting information from their leaders in the Jay they only They're only looking at we, how we can get back. And all of a sudden, there's cars flooding out of Saudi City to attack all the Sunni sites that they can do. That probably isn't rational. It's a goal oriented, but the goal is shaped whether that goal was rational or not. I don't want to really get wrapped around the axle, but that is sort of the, the there's these different ideas about it. Um, and you can, I'm, I'm asked to talk about, I don't know what I'm going to say, but on Thursday, I'm going to be on the scholar circle or something talking about Trump and emotions. And you know, this is, um, he is trying to, he's just building them. But my idea is the people in Nebraska and already have this idea about their status in this country, how this country is being taken away from them. He didn't create that, but he is going to create images and language that are going to reinforce this in a way, to me, which is just nihilistic. Um, and so, um, but I'm not sure the, you know, but you can, you can both have status and money as your desires. And if resentment's doing both of them, you know, why not? I don't don't see any contradiction there. And this is my idea about some people saw the Jaysh al Mahdi because it wasn't a very professional organization. It had a lot of criminal elements, especially when it expanded up to like 40,000 members. A lot of people are getting in on the game so they can, can be criminals rather than the, the Shia part. But they're also, it's a Shia organization. So why not? I can be looting and I can get the Sunnis out of their neighborhood. So there's the, this emo the emotions they have about resentment, if it's going to go both ways, I, you know, I don't see where that has to be separated. Uh, you know, this is the thing, like, oh, the bad guys, they can't have, you know, also group identity. I can, it's very easy to be a thief and a nationalist, and they go together lots of times. So. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to take names, uh, starting with Dick Betts, but others just keep your uh, hand up while I write them down. Uh, 
the tour will have eight questions on the policy lessons, how, uh, what the strongest lessons are, and how we can keep the strong lessons from uh, being forgotten or overlooked. Uh, and and I'm, I'm interested in what you see as the lessons that are sort of sui generis to Iraq or are generalizable and maybe can be compared to uh, a fair amount of American experience in this business, going back to the Philippines, yeah. Central America, and the Caribbean, Vietnam, and so on. Uh, and uh, it strikes me too that uh, uh, we, we shouldn't project too much from what's evident at present. In other words, the reaction against counterinsurgency and, and involvement of that sort. Uh, because that impulse seems to me to be pretty resilient historically. And, you know, whether you take the Klingberg cycle seriously or yeah. way hearts, there's a, this argument about the oscillation in, in American uh, policy. And uh, as far as uh, sort of lack of interest in counterinsurgency, uh, which through now, nowhere near as strong as it was after Vietnam. Yeah, right. I mean, they, I mean, it just wasn't indifference to, to the, the army made a corporate project of deliberately forgetting everything learned about counterinsurgency in Vietnam. Uh, but uh, it, they came back. So uh, what sort of uh, strategies might uh, distill and, and purvey the uh, the strongest lessons and uh, keep them from having to be rediscovered after paying a great price 30 years later. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right about the Vietnam, but you know, when George, the, when George W. Bush came into office, he said, we're not going to do this either in 2000. And we're getting out of this small, you know, the, the wars other than whatever the, you know, and all of a sudden we're in Iraq and Afghanistan and we've forgotten, consciously forgotten the lessons from before and we're, we're redoing some of those. And um, I think we're going to, we could be back at that again. I, I could imagine if we get hit with another 9-11 on the domestic homeland and we're going to go into another, uh, we could we could be doing that even without all this rhetoric. And, uh, but I gave a talk at, Naval War College last week, you know, I was talking, and yeah, they don't want to talk about this anymore. But, um, but I think a few of them are like, hey, you know, we we don't want to repeat the the other thing. But you know, there's there's a uh, um, it, it's a question about learning, and I talk about that in chapter twenty two about how the military for, forgot Vietnam and all that, and whether we're going to do that again. I think there's a good chance. We'll end up doing it again, but I think that the broader lessons, and there are, I think, uh, I think I have a section on the broader lessons, but um, uh, some idea about the limits of military intervention, what it can do, and the idea that we're going to, especially with instituting uh, democracy against legitimate leaders, I think this is um, uh, a big lesson that we can't expect that to go over it well. And the, the other thing is, none of these societies are blank slates that we can write on. And there was a real big underestimation of the Shia organizations. Uh, I mean, the Badr coming in, uh, the Sadrus, and then their offshoots. Um, having some idea about who are the uh, the people we can actually work with. And of course, in, in Vietnam, with Deem and all of the other ones, there was, we we're always looking for, for our guy, but sometimes there's no, nobody that we can really, really focus on for that. I, I also think um, having a better understanding of the social bases where violence originates from. I, there's a lot of good work on the North Vietnamese and how they were able to sustain and perpetuate and, and who the opponent was. And I think we have to do a lot more on that. The tendency for the United States, given how big we are, is to think everything is determined by what we're going to do. And the it's, it's mostly determined by what people there are going to do. And the Iraqis, we didn't understand them, and we listened way too much to these immigrants. And it's because 
people in the United States wanted, they sold them a bag of goods about what they were going to find in Iraq. So we can't be doing that. And we have to look at the sources of legitimacy. And, um, uh, and sometimes we're going to have to recognize that democracy as we know it, it's not going to work. And whether we need to have these consociational elements, which we did in Iraq, but they were sort of captured by the state early on. Also, the idea that the state is not going to be captured by these groups is something I think it's because uh, we're going in, we're going to build a state. Well, that, that state is, uh, the Bader had an idea right away they were going to capture the Minister, Ministry of Interior. And they knew that, and you know, they have some idea about how that, that works. But um, I'm hoping to get at the limits of military intervention, what it can do and what it can't do. And I, uh, I think that the, the military part of this was, there was some learning that should not be forgotten in, a, in the Iraq case, as there was, I think, in Vietnam. But um, there's a lot of questions in Vietnam, as well as Iraq, if we stayed longer, that's the counterfactual, right? If we just stayed longer, it would have been better. And that's a lot, I don't think that counterfactual works. I don't think it would have worked in Iraq and I don't think it would have worked in Vietnam. So that's one, it, um, you know, it's counterfactuals in Iraq. If we had not disbanded the, um, the uh, Iraqi military, I, I think there would have been a lot of problems with other groups in the military we built was, um, uh, uh, not good the way it was, but it wouldn't have been good then either. So there's knowing, going back and looking at these cases, I think there are some of these lessons that emerge uh, about, about things. But um, uh, this one, the people in the Bush administration, this I weren't even really curious about what was what they're going to find them. And then the bigger questions too about the the military versus the State Department, and who's going to do what. This was given over to the military, and military guys were doing their best, but they don't know what they're doing. That's right. Um, so uh, I'm not, I'm not floating around your, your, floating around your question, but I think these are the things, and and I do have a section about these lessons, and uh, I didn't take it's already you know 600 pages long, so um, the comparative cases, but I make. The whole method applied to the Milan case is Appendix 1. And so I'm looking, because the British say that was a great case. But really, it's, it wasn't great for the reasons the British thought. But but there are these types of lessons. And I'm hoping in articles I write after this to make some of these comparisons across the, the cases in, in Vietnam. Because I think there are some things here. But this whole hubris idea that, that what we can do with military intervention um, but I think the opposite, that we can't do anything with it, is also wrong. And that's where we're at. And a lot of the pure competition people who just want to do war gaming and the straits of time on, we need to keep this. Another another thing, though, that happened in, in Iraq, and I'm not sure this happened in Vietnam, I don't think it happened in Vietnam, but the JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, this really took over from other, like the Green Beret type of mission. Of actually understanding the population here. Everybody wanted to be Superman and go whack some high value target. And you're you become you want to do what you're good at. This is the problem with decapitation. We became very good at it. And a lot of people in the military are going to want to do what they're good at rather than this messy state building stuff. So as far as our special operations community, this is why I'm giving talks and I especially want to give talks with Marines to talk about the future going forward, where we have to get back to understanding some of the people we're dealing with at a different level, rather than just going after high value targets. Kim Martin. Thanks, this was a terrific talk and I really look forward to reading the book. So thank you very much. I have two questions that are sort of follow-ons from, uh, from Dix about whether there are two basic lessons that could have made things different. The first, you just mentioned in your, your comments recently that the State Department was essentially picked out of the equation by the civilians in the George Bush Defense Department. Um, they had encyclopedic knowledge of, of Iraq, probably including things like what the batter group was doing. Uh, so the first question is, if the State Department had been included and the State Department experts had been listened to, 
But there have been choices that the U.S. made that were more reflective of the tribal situation and the militia situation that would have made the outcome better. And the second question is, I'm wondering, uh, with, with all of your mentions of the Interior Ministry, um, you know, early on, the United States decided that the Interior Ministry was going to be given to the Shia. And that allowed the two things to happen that you really concentrated on in your talk. The first was getting information from Saddam Hussein's intelligence files about who had done what under Saddam Hussein's rule and therefore knowing exactly who the informers were and who to get rid of because of the money. Um, but the second thing was that after the Sons of Iraq program was coming to a conclusion, the U.S. had, had the expectation that these people would become police officers. The Shia, who were in charge of it, made sure that they were sent to areas where they'd be under threat and that they would be in places where they wouldn't get promoted. And so I'm wondering how important it was that the interior ministry was given to the Shia that actually created this power dynamic that allowed um, the things to happen that you talked about. Yeah, the first question is the State Department was... Um, uh, and you know, I you know I dealt more more with military people and state department people, but military people like they would have liked to have had the state department. Yeah. yeah. And it's like we don't know what we're doing. One of the problems, though, is the state department was so concerned about the safety of their personnel that you know you, you needed the rules were pretty restricted for them traveling around Iraq. And I think if the state department is going to be more effective, they're going to have to get out and loosen up their rules. Some of them are going to get killed, right? And whether the State Department has that type of tolerance for getting its people killed in some of these areas, that's another issue. Um, I mean, I, I went with Marcin, like, to the Academy of Mosque, and this was where I really understood that she has a different culture. Because that mosque in the area around it in that neighborhood is like, wow, I'm in a different place in Iraq here. And she said that she, the State Department people never had visited that mosque because it was off their rules. And that, you know, um, so this is, I think, one question. I mean, then we try to go with the PRTs, right? And trying to get in embedded in a, in a different way with that, which is a whole other issue. But I think this was... Um, there, I mean, it was a dangerous place. And, you know, so we sent the military guys in and they're like, well, you know, we're willing to go in here and stay. So I think there's got to be some some more discussion about that. But there's just hostility and if the Republicans in power, you know, they see the State Department as a democratic um, sort of institution, which is, which is a problem. Uh, but yeah, the State Department definitely needs to, state and military need to work out some of this better. Uh, the Interior Ministry, the chapter I have, the one that was done with the interviews with Nakib. So Nakib was actually a, a Sunni, and he had been in the country for 30 years. And of course, we put people like him in charge. He's from the Tikrit area. He's the governor of Tikrit first. And then he got in charge of the um, Ministry of Interior. And the idea was that the whole police system was so corrupt and so embedded from other actors that he would create the wolf brigades that would be only responsible to him and maybe the prime minister. And of course, the guy he put in charge of it was his uncle, which doesn't help things there. So um, the wolf brigades were not accountable. And then the 2005 election happened, and Bader wanted one thing in the negotiations of the winning Shia coalition, and that was the Ministry of Interior. And they took on the Wolf Brigades, and pretty soon what they found, they were running prison camps in basements around Baghdad, using the information on the, the files on the Sour guys and torturing all, and they were, I think they were 99% Sunnis that they were going after. Um, so, uh, there, so one thing was the, the this special group, which is going to then be reformed, the National Police, of course, 2006 is the year of the police in Iraq because we saw how far that had gone badly. And um, but by then, uh, the the police stations locally were never there was never much um, uh, effort there, and just completely corrupt. If you look at the Captain America, the students in Bayai never talked to local police. They were not. They were just completely taken by them. Um, 
so I'm not sure I'm answering your question though, but the, the, the security system got taken over the local police by different groups, Ministry of Interior, um, but all of these groups with uh, the ability to have day-to-day -day force were taken over by the Shia. Paula Salamina. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk as well. Um, I have, I, I particularly like your emphasis on causal mechanisms and the role they play in the strategizing of actors. And I have sort of two questions about, about the analytical framework that you developed. One is, where do you see a role for ideology or broadly speaking, systems of beliefs in your, in your framework? And the second is, what role do sort of varying degrees of internalization of say things like social norms, like beliefs play yeah. in sort of the strategies effective effectiveness for shifting people um, towards certain roles? Yeah, let me let me go if I'm not going back. You'll be good. So of the mechanisms that I this comes from a long reading of Civil War literature, and in fact, the first iteration of this book it was it was going to be called the Social Science Guide to the Iraq War, and I was going to go through all of the social science literature. Like, what good is it? That was the idea of it, and it was going to be co-written with John Lindsay and Austin Long, who used to be here at SEPA. And uh, then those guys got involved with a bunch of other stuff, and. I started writing everything as a huge like lit review and I, I, I was boring even myself. <laughs> so I moved all that, that's appendix B, it's a 50 page appendix <laughs> of all the literature that is related to the mechanisms that I have. So you can go and see all of the, the APSR, APJ, all of the major articles on these mechanisms in the appendix B. Um, which I hope to, to write this about what we, we know. But what I gleaned was these types of mechanisms are most important between different nodes of the spectrum. So moving to minus one, that's the unarmed, unorganized support of the uh, insurgent is this emotion against, hey, we're, we're not in the right status position. Sunnis and Shia had that. Shia historically, but Sunnis, like, why are we underneath the Shia now? Safety in numbers, this is rational. You don't want to get out there and say, I'm supporting this if other people aren't. You got to have to see enough other people out there. Status rewards, do you get status from your community by saying, you know, it's it's our turn now. And focal points, that is um, uh, places where you can actually see both the safeties and number, but the people are agreeing with you. One of the ideas here is to Shia religious practices are far better than Sunnis for focal points it's because they have Friday sermons, because they have emulation in their religious, um, you're supposed to emulate one of the ayatollahs, and there's only five ayatollahs that you can emulate that are worthy of emulation. So you already have a system of a small number of leaders. Those leaders have Friday sermons which have focal points because everybody shows up and you can see how many other people are followers. You can see that there's a lot of them. And you can see that this is a Shia religious message that allows you to see your resentments actually talked about. So the, the Sunnis don't have a lot of that. Now movement to plus one, same kind of thing, but what the counterinsurgent wants to do is especially try to use money and economic projects here, but you have that kind of thing. Now, movement back and forth, a lot of people, why did they never get out of zero? And this is the Mansour case in the book. The most capable people of supporting the U.S. democracy project were probably middle-class Sunnis from the Mansour neighborhood. They never get involved. Why don't they? It's because there's just too much violence going on and they're at zero. And then when the, the jam starts coming in, Jay Shalmati comes in, they all leave and they end up in Amman, Jordan, where I talked to them there. Um, but I think movement to minus two, this is where the norms are really important because now you're making a decision where I'm gonna get a gun and I, can, I might kill somebody and I might get killed. 
And you don't, you move to minus one more because maybe you're ideologically inclined to do so, or you feel the resentments more. You usually only move here through a strong social norm. Somebody else in your group got involved and you get involved too. And in Anbar, somebody else in your tribe, your tribe is getting involved, you'll get involved too here. So I think norms are most effective at this node and moving people into the local armed uh, force. And I think norms of honor and revenge, um, if some of your people get killed in your tribe, you have a duty to avenge, avenge them. This is a lot where AQI got in problem in Anbar because they were killing members of tribes. And so they were getting anti, this is when you're turning here because of, of these norms. I think anger is something which drives you to this local thing. I think this is where you get anger against the collateral damage. A lot of times US military was, was bombing someone, killing a family, and you're gonna get the motivation to move into an arm, you're going to make that motivation. I mean, this is true. I, I don't know what, I don't want to get into Gaza, but we're creating, you know, this is what's going to happen. There's no hope for this place, I don't see. Safety and numbers, material incentives. I think the two levels where you see the norms, I think you get different emotions, different places. I think you really get ideology and moving to the three level. I'm not only going to get armed, and I'm not only going to get involved. I'm going to get out of my, I'm even going to dedicate myself outside my community. I'm going to join the mobile force. People join Al-Qaeda because of the ideology of it. And uh, I, that's, that's, these are sort of predictions. This is my template. And I'm looking to see whether this works or not. It may not work it, in, in any situation you go to. It's going to be a little bit different, but this sort of guides your thinking and says, hey, which mechanisms in other cases has Peterson looked at and thought they were important? They may not be important in my case, but let me look at those first. And then, but in my idea, the AQI guys, ideology, but not so much at the, this level. This level is more local norms and what happens to your people and if they're getting killed or not. And I think this is also a movement to plus three, um, getting paid to be a soldier in Iraq. But lots of times they were just giving half their pay to their military commander to get out of service. And there were half the soldiers in Mosul want to collapse with those soldiers. And then pride, I mean, this is why you get into the U.S. military as well, as well, you know, you can be and get a college scholarship, but also there should be some sort of pride or ideology connected to the country. The problem in Iraq is there wasn't much pride in the armed forces. So plus three levels. And in fact, when ISIS came in, you could have joined the Iraqi military forces or you could have joined the Shia um, uh, militias. And most people joined the Shia militias. And, and there's a lot of pride actually in the Shia militias fighting against ISIS. Um, that's why they have legitimacy and why they're lasting because they, they or at least because of that. But I think social norms here sustain you why do you not get out of this and just go back to neutrality? I think the norms of your group are you're not going to defect from your group because enough other people are, unless a lot of other people are expressed on the social norms. Um, psychological mechanisms don't play kind of dissonance, tyranny of some cause, don't play a big role in my study, except for once a lot of people have been killed, um, you tend to keep going because there's, there's tyranny of some cause. But uh, you could probably do more with this, but I put this template down, but I think ideology makes the biggest difference here. And I think norms make a bigger difference to the two level. And uh, the plus, the one level, I think it's more because it's less, um, you're less in costly to join this. I think there's, there's resentment rather than uh, anger. And I think really what drives people here, minus three, and this is, I think is an old slide, is humiliation. Humiliation drives you to join organizations like um, Al-Qaeda or Hamas. Okay, we have three more questions. I'm gonna group them. I actually think we need to get the room to the classes coming in. So we might 
need to clean up. Oh, um, sorry okay. to cut it short. Let's, but we might not have time for more questions. Let's let's let them say like in one sentence okay. what their question would have been so <laughs> that logic can know who to talk to afterwards so uh itai gilbert and then garrett kurdistan <laughs> okay gilbert. There, there is a deep state in kurdistan and it the kdp and puk are using it to maintain their status quo to the detriment of state building. thank you gilbert I'll pass. I, I don't think I can uh, organize my trust. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry about this afterwards, but the collapse of the Iraqi army in 2014. No. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>